Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hi, I'm Steve Heider, Chief of the Colony Police Department. Today's show is a continuation of a series that looks into the police department, its people, its activities, some of our policies, and in hopes of maybe even projecting some tips to you on how you can make yourself safer, whether it be in your home, your business, or anywhere as you travel across the roads. You know, when we look at when I came to the police department in 1973, I came as a police dispatcher. And in those days, the radio system was not a lot different than what a ham radio operator would have in his basement. High tech? Not really. But when we look at how well, we've come forward through the years, and as I was hired as one of the first five civilians in the department, that was a novel idea for that time period. In the past, all police departments had uniformed personnel that took care of the dispatch duties, that took care of front desk duties. And our department was one of the first in the area to realize that the place for those uniformed people were on the road, making them safer for you and being able to respond to your calls. Instead, we man our entire dispatch area with civilian personnel, highly trained, sophisticated, people who are able to answer your every call for service, whether it be for police, fire, or EMS. Through the course of the year, we handle over 100,000 emergency calls, not in, in addition to all those calls that we receive at our front desk for information, for directions, or for people who have problems that they just have nowhere else to turn but to a police department. We've made great strides during the course of the last 35 years. Our communication division now has 29 people who work on a 24-hour day basis, seven days a week, in order to meet your needs as consumers in the event that you have a problem. Today, joining me are Tom Bortle and Lori Conker, Tom being a assistant director of communications, and Lori, a public safety senior dispatcher in charge of a shift at the police department during the course of the day. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you, Chief. You know, as we look at uh, the division and what's transpired over the years, it's almost like it's three generations sitting here. When I started, the radio system was very, I wouldn't want to say amateurish, but it was basically not much more, as I said, than a ham radio operation that's in somebody's basement. Tom, I know when you came here, we we moved upgrade a couple times, and now, Lori, by the time you got here in the 90s, we're dealing with a situation that, even though we've now since replaced that system too, it's a much more automated and very, very highly sophisticated. So this should be a, a very in-depth discussion. Now, Tom, why don't you just start off by uh, give us a little bit about yourself to introduce yourself to the town. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm uh, on my 30th year of employment uh, with the communications division. Uh, started back in 1978 as a part-time uh, dispatcher uh, and moved to full-time uh, shortly after that. Uh, through that time, uh, several years went by and we created positions called Senior Public Safety Dispatchers, which is what uh, Lori's title is now. Uh, and so in 84, uh, became Senior Public Safety Dispatcher and uh, uh, progressed uh, to the move, through the move of, uh, to our new building uh, over on Wolf Road, uh, where I became a uh, Assistant Director in 2003. Now, a lot has changed since 78 when you came on board. And I know that, uh, as with a lot of us, uh, you came initially to uh, use it as a stepping stone to be a police officer. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, that typically communications was typically looked at as the stepping stone to become a police officer on the road. Um, and that was one of my intentions when I wanted my employment uh, with the police department was to use that as a stepping stone. Uh, but shortly after I was put on full time, uh, the creations of uh, Senior Public Safety Dispatcher became and uh, the uh, chance for advancement, if you will, besides just being a dispatcher for your whole career, uh, became evident and it looked like it would be a very interesting prospect as a career. Uh, and I could see, or at least at that time, it appeared that uh, it was becoming a career uh, to people instead of just a stepping stone. And although uh, it took several years for that transition of communications not being the stepping stone, uh, 
uh, I saw back then that, that it was a career that I had a great interest in. Uh, radio communications was a, a big thing back then. So. Well, and I think it, it shows throughout our division, so to speak. And we have 29 people currently assigned to the division. And you got to be careful about using a stepping stone, because remember, I used it as a stepping stone. Exactly. Um, I only served a year in there as a uh, dispatcher, but then I served another year, a year and a half as a sergeant when we still had a sergeant directly supervising it. And I think that's the, the big thing that's happened is a transition from we no longer have that uniform personnel, sworn personnel, specifically assigned to communication that you guys basically run the place. Laurie, how about yourself? I'm in my 14th year there. I started uh, part-time. I was with the uh, Emergency Medical Services Department before that, and that's how I found out about the job. I was part-time four years, and then a full-time position came open, and I dropped out of nursing school to take the full-time job here. And Are you happy with that? Yes, I am, because <laughs> I, I actually knew from the first week of training that this was going to be my career until I retire. You know, I think that's an important point to make is that, as Tom said, we've had over 50 people use, and I hate to use the word use, but become employed with us as dispatchers, as communicators, as the name has changed throughout the years, that have gone on to not only our police department, but other police departments of the area as, as police officers. And I think what's uh, unique about our situation even today, though, is how many of us now have stayed with the program, how many of the people working in the division now, it is their careers. And at last call, I think we've actually had three people retire with over 30 years of service. That's correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, they had. Uh, early 30s year, yeah, 33, 34 years of service, so that was a long time for them to be there. Uh, right now, I think I'm the most uh, tenured uh, with 30 years, and then, uh, uh, then there's a few with 20 plus, so. You know, I think what we need to explain for the people is, you know, when we say there, you know, there is like a term of, you know, a pie in the sky, what kind of place you're working in. Tommy, can you just give us a, a couple of minutes on the actual geographic footprint. What's the, what does this place look like in communications? Well, it's uh, laid out where there's several working positions for our dispatchers. Uh, there's a staff on that uh, typically man a uh, console that is considered a police console. Uh, we have a fire console, an EMS console, uh, a console for phone answering uh, only, and we have uh, two supervisory consoles that, uh, depending on the time of day, could be manned uh, uh, with, with various personnel depending on the workload. Uh, but all our people are uh, cross-trained and all the consoles that I speak about are uh, redundant. In other words, they all have the same functionality. Uh, and our people, like I say, are cross-trained where one day they may be the police dispatcher and the next day they'll be the EMS dispatcher or uh, just be responsible for answering all our incoming 911 phone calls. So. Speaking of that 911 designation, what does that mean for the town? What do, where do we fit within a 911 system within Albany County? Well, in Albany County, there are six primary uh, E911 centers, if you will, and Colony being one of them, uh, major uh, 911 answering points. And uh, we all uh, work together to have the same standards and uh, give the same kind of service uh, as you would get if you were in uh, uh, into the hill towns of Albany County or if you were in the suburb of the town of Colony, you'd get the same kind of service. And uh, 911 uh, obviously came around in 19, uh, I believe it was 94, uh, and back then it was just a landline which developed into now our agency uh, accepts uh, cell 911 calls, uh, which kind of doubled our uh, 911 call intake. but. Um, through the technology and the equipment that has come about uh, allows us to handle that workload a little bit more efficiently. You know, and when we talk about the 911 cell calls, in years past the state police had been the main receiving point for 911 cell phone calls, um, but they passed that on to the localities back last summer. And you know, I know for a fact that we're averaging two to 3,000 more calls per month. And it's not necessarily police calls, but what happens is if a person sees an accident on the Northway, we're allowed to get 50 calls on that one accident, even though we've already dispatched the car, but we have to answer the phone the same way every time. Um, Lori, as, as far as that, you know, give, us an give us a feeling of what the average day is in the life of a police dispatcher, because you're working right alongside them, physically within, the, within that confine, every, with the room we talk about, although maybe 30 by 30, everybody's within 15 feet of each other. So just tell us what the average day would be. 
The average day you come into work in the morning, you sit through a briefing, and we discuss pertinent events, things that patrols might be, need to be aware of, uh, missing people, um, scams that are going on, suspects, things that everyone in the department needs to know about. After that pertinent information is dispersed, we go to our assigned positions and we relieve somebody there. There's always, there's always a person in that spot. We sit down, we get another short briefing from them, and you immediately jump in. If the phone is ringing, you jump in, you pick it up, and you slide right into what you need to do, whether it be answering a 911 call, um, in, dispatching an ambulance, dispatching a fire department. Um, we do have some downtime, so we're able to sit and chit chat with each other about our personal lives and things like that. And we have our lunch breaks, and every day is different. Every day is a new challenge. Every day is something more interesting than the day before. I think that's what <clears throat> makes it for a lot of people, the whole field of police work. And whether you're, you're in it from the uniform side, or the support side, or from the communications, which I like to consider communication, communications on the front line because what people don't understand is that you are the people that take that first phone call. Yes. <clears throat> you are the people that take the last phone call on an incident. And it could be one thing I remember, even from my time a long time ago, is that you could be having the slowest day in the world, bored to tears, and in the next minute not be able to leave your chair for two hours yes. because something happens. You know, I know you worked during the ice storm yes. uh, in December. Describe how that was. Very, very busy. I think that has been the busiest in my 14-year career. We had two days that we had lunch in our room, which we typically don't. You get your hour to go out and do what you want to do and recuperate and come back. And it was phone call after phone call after phone call. And it was extremely busy. And a lot of it probably could have been directed toward more appropriate agencies like Niagara Mohawk, but people don't understand, so they call us to look for help, and that's what we do, and we guide them, or we help them in whatever way we can. Now, what advice do you have for the people, though, who like to call 911 for every little thing? 911 is for emergencies <coughs> only, and we want to keep, we have six lines dedicated for 911, and we want to keep those open for actual emergencies. So some people, they like to call if their power goes out because they want a status on when it's going to come back on, but that needs to be directed to National Grid. And we give them the information and, and help them to ascertain the information they're looking for. But it's definitely medical emergencies, police emergencies, fire emergencies, things that are of value that are, are going to yeah, and people need to realize we have a separate business number for the police department, which is well advertised. It's uh, on, in every phone book, in all of our literature. We're very careful, and it's 7832744. Um, and that is where a ton of business is conducted during the course of a day. Yes, and I know that our men and women answer a boatload of phone calls of non-police matters. It's just that we have come to learn that in the town, we sometimes are the answering point for people that just have a problem and don't have anywhere to go. Yes. Now, Tommy, when somebody calls 911 and that communicator decides that, you know what, this is, an emergency, this is not an emergency, what are they going to tell the people? Well, they have a, a couple of options, really. <laughs> uh, if it's the only call coming in on 911, they would take care of the business, advise the uh, uh, caller, you know, the, exactly that it is not an emergency, but they will take take care of their whatever their situation is or their complaint is. Or if it be uh, a, a heavy workload day where their phones are ringing, uh, quite frequently they'll take that and they'll switch it to a non-emergency line and then conduct the business on that, just to keep the 911 line busy. But uh, in, no, in no time will, even if they are busy, will they get a busy signal if you call 911. How is that? Uh, well, uh, all the uh, phone answering points in the, in the county that are 911 centers, uh, they sort of have a, uh, a sonnet loop or a, uh, a backup system, if you will, in place where if one agency's 911 lines are tied up, uh, it would uh, then vote and then go to the next uh, 
phone answering point or 911 center that is dedicated to answer our overload, overload if you will. So this, there are times that we've actually probably taken calls from residents in the city of Albany. Many times, Because yes. their system is tied up. That's correct. We are the backup for the city of Albany, uh, and they have, uh, I believe, eight incoming 911 lines. And when they get busy, we, we back them up. And then when we get busy, the town of Goodwin would back us up, and then it all turns around. So at no time should anybody get a busy signal from 911. I think what, uh, what was interesting years ago, Albany County was actually one of the last local counties to get 911 service. That's correct. And during those times, though, it was four or five years after the show 911 was on, and it universally across the country, 911 was the accepted number to call. The problem is if you called 911 for the town of Colony, it's very possible that an operator in Syracuse or Rochester answered the phone mm -hmm. because that was the nearest 911 point that was, had a line open to answer. Um, today, those, those troubles are gone. Yes, the technology has advanced itself where mm -hmm. it is able, to, where the uh, uh, databases that are kept are able to be able to pinpoint where each of these phone numbers are coming from. Uh, and, and with the inception of cell 911, that's a technology uh, problem, if you want to call it a problem, that they're running into now with the phases of cell 911, where their uh, accuracy is not as pinpoint as a landline 911 call. So uh, it's very important in the case of a cell 911 call that uh, our dispatchers get the exact location of where these people are because it's not indicated to us as much as it is for a landline call. Yeah, I think that's uh, what's uh, somewhat surprising to people when they call the police department is how much information our dispatchers are looking for. Now, Laura, you know, if you take a call for an emergency call, um, maybe involves a crime in progress. You know, what, what are the type of things that you're going to be asking? The very first thing I'm going to want to know is where this is happening, what the address is, cross street, if you're not quite sure, and then I want a phone number. So if we get disconnected, that I can call that person back and get more information. Mm -hmm. If it's a crime in progress, we want to know as much information as we can, what the people look like, if there's weapons, what are they doing, how many people are involved, any injuries, and we need to get the appropriate people there. We then start with police, um, getting them going. If there's injuries, we get the ambulance going. Um, we stage them so they don't get injured, but we have them right nearby so that as soon as the scene is cleared, they can go right in and start treating people. And the most important thing is the location and the callback number. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, most of the times we won't even disconnect the line with somebody unless they disconnect with us first, correct? That is correct, and if they do disconnect with us and it is a priority call such as an in-progress call or even a medical call where maybe somebody is unconscious, we will call back and we will keep calling back till we can get the information that we need to get for officer safety and for the safety of the other people that are there with them. Right. How about 911 hang-ups? I know we get hundreds of them, uh, most of them are mistakes. Uh, what do we do about them? I mean, you know you've got a hang-up call. Does anything show up on our screens when we get that 911 hang-up? Yes, if the connection is made to the 911 center, even if they hang up immediately, the call will still continue to come through the trunk line, if you will, and when the dispatcher picks it up, it will show the information on who just called us. In the case of a landline 911, it will give us our specific name and address and phone number that just dialed that 911 number. And then what do we do? Uh, and then we follow up. We call them back and ask and, and ascertain whether or not there is an issue there that we need to have to send somebody on, or uh, if it's a child playing, which uh, you know sometimes that happens. Uh, it's not as much as it used to because people are more educated now on the use mm -hmm. of 911, and uh, those are. You know, calm down a little bit from the inception of 911. Yeah, it's but. amazing how many people though have um, trained their children and that children when playing on the phone that's one number that they remember from being training and surprising when they're playing with the phone many times that's the number they call. That's yeah. correct. Uh, many times the parents don't realize that until a knock comes on the door or that phone re-rings again and what we have as a policy in our department is that not only will you people call them back but typically we send a police car. And the reason for that, and I've actually gotten calls from people who were disappointed because they had a police car pull up in front of the house to check on that 911 call. What they don't, didn't realize, and what even I've had to explain to them, <clears throat> is that our purpose is to make sure people are safe in that house. That if somebody was breaking in, you quick dialed, you couldn't complete the call, and maybe somebody cut phone lines, we want to make sure that police officer there is verifying that residence and everybody in that residence is okay. And I know in New York City, through many cases down there, that has actually led to a number of lives being saved 
in domestic violence cases, in child abuse cases, so it's, it's a good procedure that we follow. Um, Laura, you brought up emergency dispatch. Now, yes. we've got that big book in front of you. And I want to just talk about technology for a minute, because if you could just flip that open just to, to show the audience. You know, this is a book that is in our communication. It's a flip chart, so to speak. And it has the protocols for emergency medical. Handling any emergency medical call any that we may receive. Emergency medical call. So if you were to call from your house, as long as you can get the words out that it's a cardiac problem, chest pain, our dispatchers in the past have been able to rely upon this flip chart. When they open it up, the type of emergency is there. And describe some of the other things that the Well, the appropriate for. questioning for each chief complaint or what the uh, complaint or the medical uh, nature is, uh, there should be a card dedicated to whatever anybody could have a problem with, and our dispatchers would f just follow the protocol of answering uh, unique questions associated with that type of complaint. And then uh, based on those responses would be uh, how we de determine what the response is for the emergency services, whether uh, they go red lights and siren or if they just go uh, a normal routine uh, obeying the traffic devices, if you will, because uh, it's not considered a uh, life-threatening emergency. Uh, and if it is a life-threatening emergency or if it appears that the patient uh, may be deteriorating before the arrival of the EMS, uh, the cards also provide us with instructions to uh, assist the caller or sometimes even the patient. You know, we give them instructions as simple as just, you know, lying down or sitting down or just elevating a uh, injured uh, part or body part or to complete giving uh, CPR instructions <coughs> over the phone uh, to save lives, which, you know. Um, Does it work? Well, absolutely. We have several uh, communications personnel that have received life-saving awards before based on their interjection through the uh, emergency medical dispatching protocol. And it is just one big process and part of the part of the puzzle, if you will, of calling 911 when you have an emergency. Well, I know it's hard for people to believe that, but our people have delivered babies over the phone before. They've taught people how to do CPR yes. over the phone. And it's just a natural progression, though. But then now we go high tech. Now we no longer have the flip chart. What do we have now, Lauren? This, this entire flip chart is in our computer system <clears throat> that we work with. And as soon as we determine that it is a medical call, this flip chart basically pops up in a, in a computer window. And it asks all the same questions, <clears throat> and we're allowed to pick the choice. And it re we read right off of that computerized chart the, the instructions and, and everything that is required. Well, I think what's important is that these things are at our fingertips, you know, and I think that's what's different from you go back to the 70s. It was more of a John and Sam and Steve and Bill talking over the radio, and it wasn't much before that that, you know, even in the early 60s or late 50s, there was no radio system within the town. They actually went to the corner store and called from phone back and forth, and to see how this has progressed, even over the last 37 years that I've been there, it's remarkable in the high tech. But high tech brings its own set of problems, too. Tommy, I mean, when you, we look to the future, what kind of challenges do we look at? Well, like you said, technology, it just advances so quickly. And, and sometimes the biggest challenge is to just prepare the agency, our own agency, to uh, be able to handle that advancement in technology by uh, having the right equipment and upgrading to uh, the equipment that's needed to be able to uh, perform with the technology level that's out there. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the technology goes uh, so far ahead of us that by the time we catch on board with the technology, it's already advanced another level, and so we kind of almost fall four or five years behind the times, if you will, by the time it's all implemented because of the process that it takes. Give me the most recent example of that that we can point at. Well, of course, our radio system. Uh, we had which a, is brand new. Which is uh, just uh, brand new in 2008. Uh, we upgraded to a uh, Astro 25 digital radio system, which uh, was... Uh, it used to be an analog system for the last 15 years. We upgraded to digital, uh, which uh, now does provide us with, uh, it's an IP address system, uh, which makes it a little bit more, to, uh, more challenging, if you will, to maintain because it has to be monitored daily. Uh, I think what people should know is literally totally computer run. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you have a computer screen now that you do your push to talks on a radio now in the communication center uh, where you used to have a big... Uh, four or five or six foot long console with all these various buttons on them but now it's just one computer screen with little icons on a computer screen that says transmit uh, to talk so well, it, you're minimizing it though because if you look at the pictures of our center if you look at the old ones from in the 70s uh, with the old consoles which actually the pictures that uh, are being shown are ones that were after an update or two 
when you look at what we had in the, in the 90s, I mean, that was pretty intricate all in of itself. But when you walk in today, it's almost like walking into a Star Wars show. I mean, it's computer screens, it's multi-screens, and I think the, one of the biggest challenges, I mean, we've got some of the greatest professionals working in our communications no center. Doubt about it. Um, but, you know, for everybody, I don't care whether you're 21 just coming on a job or 51, all right, and you're in your waning years, so to speak, you can't not stay abreast of the technology because it is what we do. You know, and that's probably one of the hardest things. It's, it involves constant training and constant quality control. And Laurie, I know you do some quality control yeah. as a senior dispatcher because when we talked before about having sergeants in the building 30, 30 years ago, I, those sergeants have basically been replaced with their senior dispatchers. So give me an example of the quality control that we try to do. We review the EMS calls, the emergency medical calls, and make sure that everybody is answering and asking the questions properly so that we're getting to the end result in the most efficient manner. We um, make sure that everyone does little things, um, like making sure that we get the customer's name when they call, and uh, we also work with the dispatchers. If they get a heavy call, we're right there with them helping them out, helping them make phone calls. And that's all part of the quality control is monitoring, making sure the rules and regulations are followed and the policies. There are a lot of policies to follow. It's very detailed, specific laws, um, motor vehicle issues that we try very hard to keep an eye on everything that's transacting along all the people in there, the four or five, six people, depending on how, what kind of a day it is. Now, Tommy, the, when you talked about technology again, and we talked about the radios, how long did it take us to plan on this radio system? Uh, this radio system was uh, started, it started taking shape back in 2002, uh, as far as uh, the, the planning process beginning and, and finding out exactly what was available out there to upgrade our system. and. Uh, here we was six years later, we finally got it implemented uh, due to uh, all the various things that must take place before you can actually change out a radio infrastructure, if you will. You know, it's, it was amazing because that was the, one of the first things that the, the first committees I formed when I became deputy chief in 2002. We knew our radio system was 10 years old. What a lot of people don't realize is that they, the manufacturers will only basically guarantee it for 10 years. That's Not that the stuff won't work, it's just that because it's uh, all computer driven, because it's all technology driven, a lot of these companies don't want to keep the old technology around. Now, when we first started looking at the Astro 25 system that you talk about, that was the newest and greatest thing in 2002. And technically today, that technology is six years old. It is six years old and it actually has uh, <coughs> newer versions than the one we actually implemented already. So. Uh, not that there's a lot of major differences, the system works the same, it's just that there's still upgrades to it that was provided already from when we first, when we uh, just turned it on last year. I know as a town administrator, and the town has done a great job of supporting us and getting us the best equipment, making sure when we upgraded the system, we upgraded the entire communications area, you know, with new furniture, new furnishings, new computers, so that it was literally top notch. But you know, as an administrator, what I have to look forward to is literally five or six years from now, we're going to have to start putting this back on the planning books to look down the future for the next radio system. Because it just seems that as the farther we go out, is the quicker they want to replace technology. And that's, that's a scary thing. Now, Laurie, it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk about a personal side of this thing. You're a mother, you have two young children, you're working in an industry that's fast paced. As you said, sometimes you can't even get out of your chair until someone replaces you. How do you put it all together? Um, this is a part of my family. Uh, my husband is a volunteer fireman, so he's kind of familiar with emergency services. Um, my parents watch my children, so they are used to the odd hours that I sometimes have to keep. Um, I, my policy is I kind of leave work at work and I go home and my home time is my home time and it makes it manageable because sometimes it can be a very stressful job. Well, it's not only stressful, but even the, the hours. Yes. I mean, we don't work from nine to five. Um, uh, holidays. Between holidays, it's a 24-7 operation. I sometimes compare it to the corrections field. Because, you know, jail personnel cannot leave until 
their people come on board. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, even in our situation, we've had to force people to stay, yes. um, and that makes it very, very difficult. I know during the ice storm, and when we'll reflect back on that one last time, we handled over 2,000 calls in 48 hours. 1,200 police calls, 700 fire calls, and I think three or 400 EMS calls. In what normally we would have entertained in a month's time, we entertain in two days' time. And I think it's just a testament, though, to the professionalism of the men and women that we have working. You know, Tommy, quickly, challenges going forward. Uh, just keeping up with the technology uh, and trying to, to keep uh, the system uh, operating and the day-to-day -day operations uh, uh, consistent and flowing uh, to provide the best service we possibly can to the, to the citizens and, the, and whoever travels throughout the town. Uh, uh, staying on top of that and making sure the employees uh, have an atmosphere that's uh, uh, as stress-free as possible, if you will, uh, by providing, like you said, uh, uh, new workstations that are ergonomically correct where they can either stand or sit or something like that. Just staying on top of those kind of things uh, day to day. Well, Lori, how about you? I would say the same. It's, it's very hard to um, stay in tune with the changes in, in computers. And when I first started, I didn't know how to drag a window. And I actually learned at the police department. Somebody sat down with me and taught me how to drag a window from one screen to another. It was paper and pen when I started. And each day, I'm learning something new about computers that I didn't know the day before. You speak of dragging sc screens. I still don't know how to do it. <laughs> when I look sometimes, when I go to the front desk area, it's amazing how many screens that communicator at that front desk will have going at the same time. Mm -hmm. On that computer screen will be a DMV screen. It could be a NCIC screen. It's just amazing how many calls that they have in quadrants on the computer. Mapping. And, and the whole mapping, which, which brings up the other point, that we're one of the only agencies in the Capital District now that use um, the automatic vehicle locators and have a real-time screen in front of us to where we know where our police cars are, and which makes things a lot more efficient uh, when it comes to dispatching calls. I want to thank Tom and Lori for being with me today. <clears throat> you know, our 911 center is an exciting place, an exciting place to work, heaped in technology, very sophisticated by its nature, but one which people make up the integral part of it and make sure that your calls for answered or our calls for service are answered in a timely fashion and put out to our personnel that are responding in a way that we make sure that we can provide the best services possible. We believe we provide a service that is second to no one, by far one of the best in the Capital District, if not the best in New York State. And we do that based on the resources that are afforded to us by town government and the progressive thinking of town leaders before and present who make sure that we are providing the best services to you. On behalf of the police department, I want to thank you for watching today. I want to thank you for having an interest in public service and public safety. And with that, I wish you a good day. Thank you. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. 